Hello, everybody. Uh, so a, a couple of names there that I've seen before. Welcome back. Um, a couple of new names. Welcome. Um, perhaps for you, for the for those newly joining, um, and as Christine introduced right at the start of the series, I, I would normally be in a, a lecture theatre full of real live students, and I would see you all and how you interact and all the rest of it. So this is very much experimental for me. Um, uh, if you do need any clarification throughout the lecture, then um, do put something in the chat and I'm happy to stop. And as we've seen in the last two lectures, very happy to take questions on pretty much anything right at the end. Um, going into this, we didn't know what sort of level, uh, what background uh, you had. There may be chemists, biologists, physicists among you. So um, I've started at fairly basic level for much of this. Um, it's also, you know, I, in my previous job, I was a, um, a chemistry professor who used synchrotrons and neutron sources. So a lot of the examples are quite chemistry and materials related, but increasingly biological and some physics examples. So I've, I've tried to give quite a wide range of examples. Um, but again, you know, depending on how, what your interests are uh, in future lectures, I can, I, can, I can adapt this. So this is lecture three. What we did in the last lecture is goes through um, the application of X-rays and then synchrotron X-rays uh, in looking at crystal structure. And we first of all laid the foundation of um, crystallography. I reminded you, I, this is just quickly going through last week, uh, reminded you of the basis of crystallography that the scattering of X-rays from a crystal gives rise to spots. The position of the spots tells you about the type and the size of the unit cell in the crystal. And the intensity of the spots um, tells you about the distribution of atoms within the unit cell, because ultimately the X-rays are scattered from the electrons around the atoms. So the scattering intensity, if you recall, is the sum of the scattered waves from all of the atoms in the unit cell, uh, or sorry, the, the, the amplitude of the scattering. In a diffraction experiment, we measure the intensity, which is proportional to the square of this. And this is the central problem in crystallography. When you measure the intensity, you want to be able to go back to, uh, to know what the amplitude is and, and from that unravel the, the many different contributions from the atoms in the unit cell to the scattering. So I told you a little bit about why synchrotrons provide advantages over laboratory x-rays. They're brighter, you can measure things faster, you can measure smaller samples, but also crucially, and we'll bring this out more in this lecture, you can tune the energy of the x-rays in the synchrotron, and we'll see that that gives you more powerful insights into the structure. We passed very briefly through scattering from powders, because of course many materials are difficult to make as single crystals, and powder diffraction is a, is a powerful tool in its own right that gives us fingerprints of materials, and it can also tell us about how materials change as they're transformed in a chemical reaction, through a physical process, uh, and, and so forth. And we ended up um, uh, uh, right at the end of last week, um, on Thursday, getting back to this central problem in crystallography. So ultimately, what you want to be able to measure through crystallography is the density, the distribution um, of electron density in the unit cell. Rho, rho is a function of the position in the cell x, y, z. Um, and what you'd like to be able to do is to perform a Fourier transform um, uh, over all of the ref HKL reflections of the amplitude. But as I've said, it's the intensity we measure, and the intensity is the square of the amplitude. So we don't know if f should have a plus sign or a minus sign in front of it. Now, if you've got a rather simple structure with only a few atoms of the unit cell, the modern computing techniques, the power of modern computers, actually allows you to, um, to solve this problem by what are called direct methods. You just throw computing power at it, and you randomly assign um, or you quasi-randomly assign plus or minus signs to, to, the, to, the, um, uh, to the, the structure factor f of hkl. And but just by looking at different permutations, if you've only got a small number of atoms in your unit cell, you can solve the, the structure nowadays directly uh, by these sort of trial and error, uh, tri tri yeah, trial and error direct methods. And that's fine for simple structures, but, and this is the start right the last slide of the last lecture and the start of this, many problems of interest to us involve structures that are much more complex. Um, most of the uh, significant molecules in your body, of bo which have a biological function, 
don't just have a few atoms in the unit cell, they can have hundreds of thousands of atoms in the unit cell. So for example, the work on the structure of the ribosome, uh, which gave the, the, the 2009 Nobel Prize in Chemistry to Ada Yonath, Venki Ramakrishnan and Tom Stites, and here's Ada and Venki in those two photographs. Um, that that um, material had hundreds of thousands of atoms in the unit cell, gave rise to many, many reflections, and it's impossible with modern computing methods, however powerful the computer, to solve this by direct methods. So the traditional way of solving this problem and the way that actually these three started out is to take advantage of the fact that the scattering from an individual atom, which depends on the, the Thomson effect that we talked about in the first lecture, goes as the square of the atomic number or the square of the number of electrons in the, in the atom. And what that means is that heavy atoms in the crystal structure are much, much stronger at scattering than any other atom. Uh, and just to put this diagrammatically, if you have a heavy atom in the structure, its individual atomic scattering factor will dominate the overall scattering from, from, from the unit cell. And you can then assign phases to F of H, big F of HKL, uh, according to the, the phase of the, in, the contribution from the individual atom. And what that allows you to do is add additional information to, um, <coughs> to, to, the, to, to, the, to the database. And um, if, you, if you make measurements from crystals that have got uh, particular atoms substituted by two different types of heavy atom. Um, you need to have at least two different heavy atom substitutions. You can then, you have enough information, information to solve the, um, the crystal structure. Now, in most biological um, uh, molecules and the crystals you derive from them, in most of them, the heaviest atom in the structure will be sulfur, which is in the second row of the periodic table. And there's a common substitution from sulfur, and that's to take the element below it in the periodic table, which has very similar chemistry, and that's selenium, which has um, uh, also forms uh, two plus ions commonly in the, or sorry, not two plus ions, but oxidation state uh, plus two in the structure. And so it's relatively straightforward to take biological molecules, proteins, for example, and replace the sulfur by the selenium in the structure. And now the structure factor from the unit cell will be dominated um, by the selenium. So this technique is known as multiple isomorphous um, replacement. It's been in, in existence for decades. And what it requires is, is clever and patient chemists to replace two different atoms in the, in, the, in the structure by a heavier atom. Sulfur for selenium is one common substitution, uh, but also um, uh, to bind to particular sites in the atom, other heavy atoms. So for example, the atom mercury commonly binds to sulfur in the structure to thiols uh, and or uranium in, in form of salts combined to carboxylate acid groups in the structure. Um, that's much easier said than done. Uh, it can sometimes take years to do the chemistry and then to recrystallize it in the, in, in the new form. And you also have to assume that if you replace one atom in the structure by another atom, you don't significantly change the structure around it. And actually it turns out that our experience now shows that these substitutions um, generally don't leave the, the actual, the, the, the chemical binding, uh, apart from that one atom, significantly change, uh, changed. Um, so, so this in principle is one way of, of solving the phase problem, but you know, it, it can literally take years and years and years. I remember as an undergrad, you know, growing the crystal um, was actually the hardest, lengthiest, most challenging part of any crystallographic measurement. The measurement themselves of these wonderful new um, facilities for synchrotrons and their x-rays are, are relatively quick and straightforward. So actually it's that initial um, chemical or biological growth that's the, 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 the tricky bit. Now, with synchrotron, and, and as I should say that you know these methods, these substitution methods, um, were also traditionally used at laboratory-based uh, X-ray sources before synchrotrons were invented. Now, as I've said, with a synchrotron source, you can tune the energy of your source, and you may recall uh, from the first lecture that the strength of the scattering from an element. So these two pictures here are just picked out of that uh, lecture one material where we, we looked at the dependence of Thomson scattering um, on the energy of the X-rays and on the uh, atomic number or the number of electrons around uh, the atom Z. Um, 
And what we saw is that the scattering, so the bottom left graph, um, the scattering of a particular energy goes up strongly with Z. It goes up um, um, in the Thomson scattering as Z to the fourth. Um, uh, it's, uh, it, the scattering is much weaker at higher energies. And if you recall, if you bring the energy of the X-rays down, so you start to see stronger absorption. So from 20 to one kilovolts to now uh, 20 times less energetic, 50 electron volts, you get a much stronger scattering. And you also start to see these, this, this structure or these edges. And if you recall, these edges correspond to the excitation of electrons in the atom and ultimately to, to photoionization. So what we find is that the, the Thomson scattering um, which is the fundamental reason why the X-rays are scattered in crystallography, um, uh, changes discontinuously, very abruptly, around one of these absorption edges, which corresponds to a transition, um, electronic transition in the atom. So one of the consequences of that is that you can tune the scattering of the X-rays by the atom by tuning the energy around an absorption edge. So instead of saying rather simply that an individual atom has a, a, a scattering factor, F, um, it has a scattering factor that actually depends on energy. So we write it, if you look at the bottom line here, we write the scattering uh, of the, the scattering factor of X-rays from an individual atom in a rather more complex form when we look at how it depends on energy. What we say is there is, there is a component that's energy independent, F of naught, um, and there are two energy dependent um, uh, phenomena um, that also contribute to the scattering. First of all, um, as you tune the X-ray energy through an absorption edge, the interaction between the nucleus and the electron becomes uh, more significant. And what that means is the, the, the amplitude of the scattered wave um, is strongly changed. So there's a component that describes the amplitude of the scattered wave. For those of you who are happy and familiar with complex numbers, so we say that the real part um, of this additional scattering um, corresponds to the change in the amplitude of the scattered wave. Um, and that the, the interaction between the nucleus and the electron near an edge also gives rise to a certain amount of absorption of the energy of the photons. So the photons that are scattered uh, have a slightly lower, lower energy, or they have a lower intensity, rather. So there's an imaginary component that represents the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the absorption of the, um, of the incoming X-rays. So in, in more general terms, the scattering of X-rays by an atom through the Thomson effect um, has a real part that, that represents the change in the amplitude of the scattered wave and an imaginary part that represents the absorption of some of the intensity of the incoming wave. So if you look at that um, uh, in, in terms of the way in which those two terms change with energy when you tune them through an absorption edge uh, for silicon and for selenium. Let's look at selenium because we've already mentioned it. Selenium is one of these um, elements that can be substituted without changing the structure into, into a protein structure. So sulfur is replaced by selenium. And what we find is around the K edge of selenium, and that's the uh, highest energy transition that involves the absorption of the most tightly bound um, electrons in the structure until they're photoionized, we find the, the change in the amplitude of the scattered wave changes very abruptly, and the change in the absorption absorbance uh, is very abrupt. So if we take a series of measurements of the crystal structure above, at, and below the absorption edge, we get three quite different strengths of scattering from this particular atom. And that's analogous to performing scattering of three samples for which this particular atom has been substituted chemically uh, for something completely different, but without having to go through all of the difficult, lengthy, um, sometimes practically impossible process of doing the chemical substitution and recrystallizing it. So we now have a really powerful technique which is equivalent to chemically substituting the material as we had in MIR with just changing the light. And this is known as multi-wavelength anomalous dispersion. And this is the basis of all modern um, crystallography on biological samples at, at synchrotrons. So we still need to ensure that there's one heavy element um, in, the, in the atom, and we'll, we'll see why in a moment. Um, so we, we still need to have 
an element in the structure that's suitable um, for this tuning the energy and, and for diffraction. Now, I've already mentioned that the element sulfur is relatively light. It's in the second period of the periodic table. So the K edge of sulfur is actually quite low in energy. So the energy at which this tuning occurs is only at two and a half electron volts. And to give you a rough idea, if you remember uh, we said in the opening lecture that, um, that typically we want to perform diffraction experiments with x-rays whose wavelength is about 0.1 nanometer or, 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 or one angstrom. This um, radiation has about five times um, uh, one fifth of the energy and five times the wavelength. And that's really significant because if you think about the, the Bragg equation, um, n lambda, here I'm just flagging it up here, n lambda equals 2d sine theta. The longer the wavelength, lambda, um, uh, for a given d spacing, the, the larger the scattering angle, 2 theta. Now, the biggest angle through which you can um, uh, scatter x rays, of course, is 2 theta equals 180 degrees. It's, you know, that takes the, an incoming X-ray and scatters it right back on itself, backscattering. So you cannot have a value of 2 theta bigger than 180. You cannot have a value of theta uh, bigger than 90. And what that means is the despacings that you can measure in a diffraction experiment are always going to be greater than or equal to half of the wavelength of the X-radiation. So if you have long wavelength X-radiation, um, you can only measure despacings down to um, that value. You can't measure shorter despacings. And in general terms, you know, so five angstroms in, in terms of crystals and so forth, five angstroms is a very, very big despacing. And if, if you could only perform diffraction experiments with five angstrom radiation, 0.5 nanometers, you'd only end up looking at the biggest despacings and there'll be very, very few of them. So yes, you can in principle perform diffraction from the sulfur edge, but you would end up with very few spots. And that gives you relatively little information from which to solve the crystal structure. There's a second reason why it's problematic performing measurements um, at the sulfur K edge with this long wavelength radiation. And that's because the lower the energy of the radiation, if you recall, um, going back to the Thomson effect, the lower the energy of the radiation, the more strongly it's absorbed. And that means that the air around your sample will also uh, strongly scatter the, the X radiation. So, um, and, and to give you a rough idea, you know, normally in a crystallographic experiment, the crystals that you're using are a fraction of a millimeter. They may only be a few microns across, a few thousandths of a millimeter across. So typically the strength of the scattering from the crystal is only a bit more than a few millimeters of air. So if you're performing these experiments at low energies at the sulfur K edge, what you'll find is that the scattering from your crystal will be dominated, will be swamped by the scattering from the air. So there are two reasons why you'd want to make these measurements at higher energies. For example, at the selenium edge, having substituted sulfur by selenium. And that's because, first of all, you can work at much shorter, much higher energies and shorter wavelengths. So you can see a much greater number of despacings. And secondly, the scattering from the air is much, much less significant. So typically what protein crystallographers do is first of all, to chemically substitute the sulfur for selenium in the structure, and then perform these MAD, multi-wavelength anomalous dispersion experiments around uh, the K-edge in, in selenium. There are other elements that one can use as well. I've also mentioned uh, mercury and uh, uranium and uranyl, and actually it turns out thallium, which has chemical properties a little bit like potassium or sodium. So th this combination of um, synchrotron X-rays and the technique of MAD has completely transformed um, uh, crystallography in the in the field of biology. And, and let's just remind ourselves about the way. So first of all, the synchrotrons themselves are far brighter than laboratory x-rays. If you compare a synchrotron like diamond behind me with the, the x-ray sources that Rosalind Franklin would have had at her disposal back in the, ooh, now, this isn't quite the latest version, I'm afraid. Um, I had some photographs of Rosalind Franklin and Crick and Watson and so forth, but I'll, I'll put that in the, the version I deposit. But anyway, the point is, 
that in the 40s, Rosalind Franklin was an absolute pioneer in the development and the application of X-ray equipment in the solution of complicated crystal structures. But her equipment was about a billion times, a thousand million times less bright, or rather the source and the detectors gave her equivalent uh, uh, brightness uh, a billionth less than that of, that of diamond. So nowadays we can make these measurements in a fraction of a second. In fact, generally, if you expose the crystal to X radiation in the synchrotron for a second or two, you completely destroy the crystal. So the, the trick actually is to make the measurements very quickly and sample the data uh, very quickly, you know, every millisecond or so. And at some point, the crystal structure will start to degrade as the X-rays damage the crystal too much, and you'll see a, a change in your in the nature of your scattering. And then you reject all of the, the later data than that. The other thing that's critical, the other two things that are critical rather, um, is that these crystal structures are uh, give are more complex and they give rise to far more spots. So here, famous photograph 51 very very few spots from beta dna um, the structure of the ribosome would have had hundreds of thousands of spots which have to be individually collected uh, and then the fourier transform applied uh, <coughs> to that collection of spots and this requires very powerful techniques crick and watson had slide rules um, nowadays we, we we put the data into very powerful um, computer clusters so actually the energy cost um, uh, some of you, as you were joining, saw behind me, I've got the, the 500 meter circumference ring of diamond, which you could imagine has a big electricity cost. It takes as much electricity as a town of 10,000 people. The computers that we need to run to do the data analysis require just as much electricity. So I, we spend as much on the compute power of the clusters, the megawatts to run the compute. Uh, computers as to run the synchrotron. And then the third thing that's critical, because we can make these measurements so quickly, it means that the bottleneck in the whole measurement process, well, first of all, it's to grow the crystals in the first place. And secondly, the measurement can take a fraction of a second. The process traditionally of mounting each sample one by one in the beam uh, would typically, even for a skilled operator, take minutes. Uh, and nowadays we've replaced the human operator uh, by, by robots. So this automation um, has become a critical part of, so, you know, um, Crick and Watson and Franklin, Rosalind Franklin, I'm gonna stop this animation in a moment. I don't know why it's auto, it's, it's auto running. Um, so just to give you an idea, if you look at the animation on the left to begin with and try and ignore this guy here, let's stop this. Um, so what we have on the left here is uh, this is a, a this is the robot um, locating a sample uh, on a on a pin in a carousel, a fixed carousel uh, in liquid nitrogen. So we keep these very cold. Um, first of all, so they're preserved in the laboratory, but also it reduces the radiation damage when you expose the, them to the X-ray beam. This is um, a, a, a blow up of um, the actual. Uh, place that the crystal will be mounted and where the measurement will be made. And then here we have a picture, an image of the crystal itself in the crosshairs of the camera. And what you'll see is, if you look at these three photographs, you'll see um, the automatic taking the sample out of the beam. The robot will then look in the dewer, the nitrogen container here for a new sample, and then it'll mount it in the beam. And it will do this it can it can change the sample in just a few seconds. Um, of course, if so, here we have the robot taking the sample off the diffractometer, um, putting it back in the dewer, moving to another position. There you go, picking a new sample out, putting it back in the beam, um, and then in a moment you'll see the new sample, and then that will be ready to. Um, any minute now, ready to run. So there's the new sample mounted, and then the operator would line it up in the beam, uh, would check visually if it seems to be symmetric and a good sample, um, and then starting to take the measurement. So that whole process typically just takes a few seconds. In the good old days, a real human would have to unlock the hutch, find the sample, put it in the beam, um, roughly center it visually, go out, lock the hutch again, because of course they can't be near the, the, the diffractometer when it's uh, running and, and repeat. And that would be the, the slowest part of the process. And here you have another view of the, of the robot. Um, so initially these were just the sort of robots you get in ordinary industry, the car industry and manufacturing, but then they've been adapted to synchrotrons and this is the model. So here we have the robot. Now it's in this case, it's not picking up a single crystal, it's picking up a, what we call a well plate. So that plastic plate that it's picking up 
has 192 little square wells in it. Each of those wells has a drop of a solution in which the crystal is growing. So we've streamlined the process so you don't even have to mount individual crystals. You can make the measurement on the sample as it's growing in its little droplet of liquid. Uh, and then finally, by way of illustration on the bottom right, the automation is speeded up so quickly now you can literally measure tens, if not hundreds, of well plates in an individual second. So what you'll see in a moment um, is uh, a scan of the, indi these are individual, these little squares here are individual wells which contain a droplet of solution that the crystal or collection of crystals is growing in. Each of them can be centered in the X-ray beam. Uh, an X-ray dose can be given, the scattering can be measured, and then it'll move on to the next sample. But it'll do that approaching 100 times a second. So you can measure 100 crystal growth systems a second with this sort of technique. Um, so it starts going in a moment and it, it'll go faster than the eye can see. So it's scrolling through every single element row by row uh, in that well plate and 192 samples. Okay, maybe not 100 in a second, but you can see that the whole well plate has been scanned in no time at all. So what we've seen is this combined development of the, the method uh, with the tunable synchrotron X-ray radiation the automation of the measurement ro robotics and then the step I haven't shown you, you just have to imagine it is all of this data huge amount of data then has to be number crunched with computers to solve the phase problem uh, and to Fourier transform to get the electron density and what you get out of that is a map showing you where all the electrons are in the structure and that in turn tells you where all the nuclei so let me give you some examples now of the sort of things that we find out from this I'm going to give you three three examples from biology um, uh, they all happen to be things from diamond, but this is the kind of measurements that are made the world over. The earliest measurement that came out of the, the Brazilian synchrotron, Sirius, for example, just, just I think the first publications are coming through, lovely structural biology um, measurements there. So first example is the foot and mouth disease virus. So this is a, a virus that affects cattle. Um, it's endemic in many parts of the world, in South America and, and large uh, areas in Africa. Um, it causes suffering to the cattle uh, and also the, the cattle that have this um, uh, virus uh, pass it on to other cattle very, very quickly. So, um, so there are two approaches. One is to kill the cattle. And uh, in the UK in the 1960s and the 1990s, millions and millions of cattle that were infected uh, with this disease were killed. It was a terrible uh, ec economic disaster. It was a terrible disaster for the livestock themselves, of course. Um, but the alternative is vaccination. Now, the way in which the traditional vaccine used to work was that it, it took essentially live virus and a very low dosage. But one consequence was the virus would appear on testing in these, even in these low dosages, um, as, as if the, 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 the cow was infected. So it was very difficult to sell cattle that had been inoculated with this virus outside regions where the, the disease was endemic. Um, so someone came up with the idea of producing a vaccine based on the virus that had had the genetically live material removed. Now, it so turns out that this class of virus um, contains, I always forget if it's dodecahedron or icosahedron, but anyway, this, this polyhedral shell. Uh, within this polyhedral shell, this capsid as it's called, there is a piece of live um, uh, genetic material. So clever genetic engineering was performed to take out the live uh, genetic material, just leaving this sterile shell behind. And that was sufficiently, well, it was essentially identical as far as the, 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 the cattle's um, uh, immune system was concerned to generate the necessary antibodies. But the disadvantage of this first generation genetically modified virus, the disadvantage was, excuse me, it was not very stable thermally. The genetic material that had been removed was an important component of stabilizing the capsid itself. So wonderful idea, but where this virus, this, this vaccine is most needed is in hot countries where the disease is endemic. So in, 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 uh, in regions in Africa and South America, and it's not very practical to administer vaccine in a hot climate if the vaccine rapidly degrades in, 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 in at higher temperatures. It requires rather sophisticated um, cooling equipment and so forth. So what the next step was to, to do was to 
look at ways um, or look at the binding between the 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 sheets in the outer shell of the of the virus structure and this is where the protein crystallography came in first of all identifying identifying it in atomic detail so this is a structure that has hundreds of thousands of atoms um, looking at in individual atoms within the structure at the boundaries between these plates identifying the nature of the bonding and then again further genetic modification to strengthen specific bonds between sheets um, in in the in, in the virus capsule so what these scientists were able to do through very detailed structural biological uh, measurements in diamond was to identify how to chemically modify it to make it much more tightly bound um, so you ended up with a shell that was thermally robust and contained no uh, live virus. And this is now the basis of a, a vaccine that is, is being manufactured and is being rolled out um, uh, across the world. Um, second example, um, still saying with bi biotech, but a, a slightly uh, unusual example. And this takes us back to the, the, the what I said earlier about sulfur not being the ideal element to use in, in MAD measurements because of the strong air scattering. Now, one of our scientists had this slightly crazy idea to put the entire uh, diffractometer inside a box, a, an airtight box, and to evacuate the box so that there was no air around the, uh, between the sample and the detector. So if you look back at the the picture that I showed you of a, a modern diffractometer here with a robot loading the sample. This, of course, is in a, in a laboratory. All of this is air. So what this particular scientist did, he said, if we put all of this in an evacuated box, there'll be no scattering from the air. Um, and that's exactly uh, what was done. So uh, it required the development of a very large area detector, which could withstand a vacuum. And then this detector together with the way of mounting the samples and bringing in the x-rays was put inside a box about two by two by two meters. And the first measurements were amazing. So um, here we have, uh, I know it just looks like a fuzzy gray pattern, but the point is each of these dots is a diffraction spot that is part of the uh, diffraction pattern from this material. And we have out here um, a, a, a blow up of a particular weak spot. So this, these, these two dark, um, the, these, these few dark pixels here are a, a magnification of a diffraction peak that is just a few counts above background. Now, normally, and this is taken now at the sulfur edge of the sample, normally the scattering from sulfur will be so weak for a tiny crystal compared to centimeters, if not a meter of air, there was no way you'd be able to see uh, just one or two counts above the background. The background will be far too strong, would swamp the sample. So this, this this was the proof of principle that you could perform um, uh, protein crystallography in a completely evacuated, with a completely evacuated um, diffractometer. And what that now enables people to do is to look at proteins in their native state. You don't even have to go through the one atom substitution of sulfur for selenium. Excuse me, I'm just going to mute this and, and cough if I'm not. Sorry about that. Um, um, so this was the proof of principle that you could perform these protein crystallography experiments in vacuum and look at sulfur directly. Um, but also, and what was nice is I, I first showed this in a lecture, uh, I think three years ago when I couldn't say what it was. It turns out that this was the first measurement of a particularly important um, biological system. So a few years ago, scientists in Japan discovered a new strain of uh, bacteria that was living on, off rubbish heaps and in particular, living off PET, polyethylene terephthalate bottles. And they'd evolved over decades to be able to digest the polymeric plastic um, as part of the, the, the cycle to give it energy and nutrients. And within the bacteria, it was discovered that they had a particular catalyst or a biolog biological catalyst called an enzyme, that, which is shown pictorially on the left here, which had evolved so that it would specifically break apart the PET um, uh, plastic samples. Um, now, that was a really interesting curiosity, um, uh, but it gave people the idea that perhaps you could breed these bacteria to produce the enzyme that could be then used as a means of 
um, remediating plastic waste. So breaking the plastic down to its monomeric units and then perhaps using that chemical as feedstock in, a, in another polymerization process. Or, for example, to be used to, to clean up the microplastics in the oceans. Um, but the, the natural process using the bacteria was really slow. So what the biologists did was, first of all, synchrotron measurements actually initially in Japan were used to determine the precise structure of the biological catalyst or enzyme. And then that was genetically modified um, with code from organisms that are thermophiles. So there are certain types of organisms that can exist um, at extremely uh, high pressures and temperatures at the bottom of, of oceans. And by combining these two uh, pieces of genetic information, a, a new breed of uh, enzyme was developed that could operate at much higher temperatures. And that means that you can then run the process um, hotter and faster, and it becomes practical to be used in an industrial process. Um, so the combination of the beautiful genetic engineering and the ability to look at these native uh, structures using unique synchrotron uh, technology, and I think there's probably a little um, movie here to run as we're talking, which went with the publicity, uh, uh, went around the world about three times. I think, I think this got hundreds of millions of hits across the uh, the world press. And this is just the illustration of the x-rays coming in, being scattered from the sample onto this large detector. Um, and then the, um, uh, the, the image is analyzed to produce this three-dimensional structure. And the glowing parts, incidentally, are the sulfur atoms within, uh, within the structure. So a very nice piece of work published in um, PNAS uh, in 2018. But if you, if you just Google plastic eating bacteria, you'll find hundreds of stories out there in the press. And then finally, the, the third thing that we do nowadays in modern protein crystallography is we use it as part of the, the, the discovery process for new drugs. Um, so pretty much every, uh, every drug that is designed um, and then produced, every new drug that's designed and produced at some point uses information gathered uh, at a synchrotron. And typically what you want to do is you, you might have some large complicated biological target molecule you want to know in the first instance is how do you stick a chemical agent, the drug, if you like, onto the particular part of the biological molecule that you want to change. You might want to slow down the biological process. You might want to speed it up. But it all starts with a chemical molecule, a molecule knowing where in this complicated structure to bind to and then bringing in with it um, uh, some other kind of uh, chemical ingredient that can interact with the biological molecule in a way that changes it uh, and modifies its behavior. So one of the things that you might want to do is to take this large target molecule and expose it to a library of little molecules, each of which have the potential to bind and modify uh, uh, particular points in the, in, in the large biological molecule. Um, and what that requires in principle is to be able to take multiple crystals of the target molecule and expose it to libraries of these potential um, fragments of drugs, this, this, this so-called fragment library. So typically what you want to do is solve hundreds of crystal structures where each structure is the biological target plus uh, individual trial molecules that might be ultimately the building blocks of, of your drug. Um, so this fragment screening process requires high automation, um, it, it requires, first of all, selection of, and here's, here's the process, the, um, the, the target biological molecule grown in single crystals. The crystals are then soaked in many different um, uh, trial solutions, hundreds and hundreds, um, laid out automatically in, in a big version of that, that, that well plate that I showed you. So you have many crystallization dishes, as it were, uh, and then these individual samples are harvested, perhaps hundreds of them, and then they individually have their crystal structure measured. And the cartoon here actually is, is the large biological molecule with a map of where all of these um, library molecules, which might one day find their way as a component of a drug, bind on the, on the crystal structure. So this crystal screening process hugely accelerates the process of looking for potential um, uh, drug binding. Uh, components. And of course, as you might expect, this was used most recently uh, in the search for new ways of 
targeting relevant parts of the uh, of the virus responsible for COVID-19. So back in January of this year, um, the first structural measurements were made in Shanghai, the Shanghai synchrotron. Um, the, 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 the virus was, um, was isolated and its three-dimensional structure was measured in detail at the Shanghai synchrotron. That then closed for routine work. Uh, and because we have strong links with key groups in China, uh, that structural biological work transferred to Diamond, where we performed the measurement of the elements of the, uh, of the virus, such as the spike protein in greater detail. But what we also started to do, and of course, other synchrotrons started this at about the same time too, is to um, then trial um, libraries of potential fragments of new drug molecules. So just as I said before, um, you would soak the, um, the virus, uh, crystals of the virus uh, in, 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 in uh, many different solutions, hundreds of different solutions, each of which contain uh, a single molecule you want to investigate for its ability to bind to the spike protein or the protease or whatever part of the COVID-19 virus you're interested in. And then look, and this map here in this part of the diagram, I'm sure it's not very, it's not very easy to see, but you can start to see that this is a three-dimensional representation of part of the virus onto which we can determine the binding site of many of these little molecules. And then that in combination with very clever um, uh, uh, modeling of the structure and optimization of the structure and understanding how it binds to the material then reveals new, new compounds that can, be, that can be searched through for uh, as, as potential components of drugs. And by, by April of this year, so between March and April, that first trial of potential target drug molecules have been been run and this is a picture of um, uh, uh, Alice Durangamath uh, who's the key one of the key scientists in Diamond working on this problem um, but this is this has played a key role as many synchrotrons have played throughout the world in trying to understand how to um, develop effective drugs against this um, against this virus to to inhibit parts of the infection um, pathway. Okay <clears throat> a few more slides on single crystal diffraction now not everything uh, uh, that we measure at synchrotrons is is only of biological interest. Uh, single crystal diffraction can also be used to elucidate complicated uh, inorganic materials. This is just one of uh, many examples I could have given you. Um, this is actually from a particularly prominent group in Manchester University in the UK, uh, Dave Lee and his group, who who developed these wonderful complex large molecules that have knotted and interconnected forms, which ultimately might provide the basis of molecular machines. It's possible now to make cogwheels and linear motors and so forth out of these large uh, molecules, not unlike actually some of the molecular machines that drive mechanically some of the processes in, in, your, uh, in your body, uh, processes like those in, in, in potassium ion channels, in, in, in signaling the mechanisms in cells, but these in an inorganic context, so large inorganic materials which require uh, the brightness of synchrotrons. And then finally, with, with single crystal materials, uh, a wonderful field of discovery, um, looking at the property of materials under extreme conditions, something that's of interest to understanding geophysical problems. You know, what are the chemical processes deep beneath our feet, uh, kilometers down where the pressures and the temperatures are immense? Um, how can we transform materials under extremes of pressure and temperature, just as we can make artificial diamonds, how can we extend that principle to making other possibly hard, possibly important electronic materials? And probably the key method is to follow the structure of such materials as you expose them to millions and millions of atmospheres. And you can do that in the laboratory with this wonderful device here. So there's a photograph here on the left. Um, this is about 20 millimeters across. You can hold it in your hand. And what this diamond anvil cell contains, as the name suggests, is two diamonds. They've been cut. So they've got sharp, well, they're not actually points, um, but they, they um, uh, have a, a, a very small facet here, a very small uh, cross-section facet here. And when you apply uh, a pressure, across the two diamonds and push them together. Of course, you amplify uh, the force in creating a much higher pressure at this reduced um, uh, cross-sectional area. And you can generate in the palm of your hand um, pressures that are approaching millions of atmospheres. And then with brilliant x-rays, 
you can shine the light um, right into this device and then see how it scatters from the material as it's exposed to these, these really um, high pressures. And this is an essential part of our understanding about the, the transformations of rocks in planets and also the potential. And this is actually a, uh, a synthetic example. It comes back to the example I gave you uh, in the last lecture about these metal um, uh, organic framework compounds, looking at, for example, how you can transform their properties and pump even more gases into them uh, at extremes of pressure, as as you find in a in a diamond anvil. So, so this this DAC work allows you to reproduce these incredibly extreme conditions in the laboratory in spaces just a few millimeters across. So, um, last couple of slides for today, and then I'll finish um, diffraction. Um, uh, uh, another key application of synchrotron x-rays as opposed to x-rays in, in looking at the structure of materials, again, arises from the fact that you can tune its energy. And this is a phenomenon known as resonant x-ray scattering. So we've already said that we can tune the scattering through the Thomson effect, um, tuning it through an absorption edge for a material uh, and use that to tune the structure factor of the individual atoms in the, in the MAD technique. But you also find that if you tune the uh, the energy of the X-rays, so here the X-rays coming in at a particular energy, um, if their energies are tuned to that of a particular electronic transition in the material, you can excite uh, a resonant scattering process. Resonant it just means that the energy that goes in is the same as the energy that comes out. So it's, a, it's an elastic scattering process. The light, the photons come out at the same energy. Um, it turns out that the strength of this scattering depends on the relationship between the initial orbital and the final orbital. Uh, and in particular, this techniques, and I won't go into all the details, it's there in the further reading um, that, that I'll give you right at the end. Well, I, I suppose I should give it you right up front, actually, if you wish to start reading now. Um, but the point is that this, excuse me, sorry. this resonant X-ray scattering technique um, gives rise to intensity of scattering, which tells you, contains information about the, the, the nature of this excited state. And it, in particular, it contains information that's relevant to understanding um, the magnetic properties and the electronic properties of this particular uh, electronic state. And this becomes a very powerful technique to try, try to understand the origin of magnetism and the electronic properties of key metals in the periodic table, and more specifically, transition metals, um, those that have uh, partly filled 3D, 4D, and 5D orbitals, and lanthanide ions. Actually, I should add to this actinide. So lanthanides and actinides, elements that have partly filled 4F uh, and 5F orbitals. And this is one of the most insightful ways of understanding the role of specific electronic orbitals in the magnetic and the conducting properties of, of materials. Now, if we go back, um, this is like any uh, electronic transition, um, a process that is governed by selection rules. So the relationship between the quantum number of the ground state and the quantum number of the excited state is critical in determining the strength of this transition. And just as in atomic spectroscopy, you saw that um, the orbital, well, it is a form of electronic spectroscopy, the orbital um, uh, uh, angular momentum has to change by plus or minus one for it to be allowed. So these transitions are strongest um, when the the uh, orbital angular momentum changes by plus or minus one. Now, in most cases, um, you're starting with the ground state, and this is an s electron. So that orbital selection rule would tell you that the excited state can only be a p state. So s to p would be the only allowed transition. P orbitals, by and large, as the chemists among you will know, and many of the physicists, are actually really boring from the point of view of, of magnetism. Um, we're much more interested in looking at D and perhaps F states. But those are forbidden transitions. So um, this process is extremely weak for the orbitals of greatest interest, which involve an S to a D, a delta L equals plus or minus two transition. But because we're working with really bright X-rays, we can start to see these really weak, um, uh, these really weak transitions. So this is something that would not be visible with a standard laboratory setup because the X-rays is just not powerful enough. 
powerful synchrotron X-rays mean you can start to see these really weak effects. So what we would like to be able to probe, we go back to the cartoon here, is, is a transition either from an S to a D orbital directly, if we're probing the properties of uh, transition metals, um, or the, the other type of transition that may also give us insight is, is an S to a P transition, but P orbitals will mix weakly in the structure um, with D orbitals. So, but either way, these are two extremely weak processes. So um, again, it just comes down to the same thing. You need brilliant X-rays to be able to probe um, either of these weak type of transitions. Um, the other thing we have to take into account is the, the phenomenon I mentioned earlier on trying to measure around the, the sulfur edge. Sulfur um, and, 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 and many of these transitions, so core to, to D transitions uh, for first transition elements are not at very high. These are still relatively light elements. They're not very high energies. They correspond to very long wavelengths. And again, we hit the problem that if the wavelength is long, then for a given D spacing, the scattering angle is big. So we could only measure um, D spacings down to, well, some quite long values. And that requires, that means that you're, the, the unit cell from which you're doing the scattering has to be quite large. And many of these rather simple uh, metal compounds as opposed to large biological molecules have quite small unit cells. So what this means is um, you, 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 you're, you're somewhat limited in this technique um, in the number of diffraction spots that you can, uh, you can observe. So it's, it's a very powerful way of probing the, um, the character of specific orbitals that are implicated in magnetism and in superconductivity. Um, but often in, in performing measurements, these are really challenging and you often are trying to gain information from a relatively small number of um, diffraction peaks. So I'll, I'll give you one example and then we'll stop there for today and I'm happy to take questions. Um, so the chemists and the physicists among you will be well aware that certain types of elements, particularly transition metals and lanthanides, contain unpaired electrons in partially filled um, shells. And this gives rise to uh, magnetism. Those individual atoms uh, have uh, unquenched angular momentum associated with electrons, or another way to think about it is individual atoms contain small magnetic moments. And we depict these with little arrows like compass needles, um, uh, indicating schematically the orientation of the magnetic moment on that particular atom. Now at high temperatures and even down to very low temperatures, most materials that contain magnetic atoms contain magnetic atoms that are independent of one another. We call them paramagnets. But there's an important class of, uh, there's an important uh, class of magnets where the forces between the magnetic atoms are sufficiently strong that if you cool them down, those forces will um, uh, give rise to the individual atomic uh, moments ordering in a in a particular pattern and you're familiar with this in so-called ferromagnetic materials where all of the atomic magnets point in the same direction um, as is the case in in iron for example or in certain types of iron oxide giving rise to an overall uh, a, a, a bulk an overall magnetic uh, polarization the vast majority of materials that order magnetically order such that uh, the orientation of the magnetic moment on any one atom is opposite to that on its neighbors. So if you look at this structure here, this, this cartoon of uh, a particular compound, which contains the elements rubidium, manganese, and fluorine, um, it's the manganese ion, which has an oxidation state of plus two here, mm. which contains unpaired electronic spin and has these relatively big magnetic moments. Mm. And then because there are uh, forces between the moments on individual atoms when you cool the system down at some temperature the forces overcome the thermal motion and this 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 collection of magnetic moments freezes into an overall ordered array in this case such that any one moment is anti-parallel to its nearest neighbors and this is an example of a of an antiferromagnet so you cool this down at some temperature, the magnetic moments order. And something changes crystallographically. So if you look at uh, this edge of the cube, um, halfway along the edge, um, start at this corner here, uh, zero, zero, zero. 
uh, and, and move upwards, halfway along this edge, there's another atom, right? So if you took the magnetic moments away from these atoms, this uh, half of the edge um, <clears throat> is actually the edge of a, a cube of, of, of the manganese atom. So if you, if you ignored the, um, the magnetic moments on the individual manganese atoms, this would actually be this, this, this little cube here that's one eighth of the volume of the big cube. This would actually be the minimum repeating unit. It would actually be the unit cell. However, when you cool this material down and the magnetic moments order, what you find is that this atom and this atom are no longer equivalent in the structure because they have a, a magnetic moment on them that's pointing in opposite directions. You have to go all the way up to this atom here before you start to see an atom, before you see an atom that uh, looks the same again. So the repeat unit in this case um, has, 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 has increased in size. So we say that the magnetic unit cell for this um, is, is larger than the nuclear unit cell. And a measurement like Rick's, which is sensitive to the magnetic character of the manganese ion, and in particular, it's sensitive to the orientation of the moment on the manganese, um, will actually reveal that when this compound orders magnetically on cooling, the magnetic unit cell, uh, sorry, the unit cell expands from the, the simple little one eighth cube cell into an expanded unit cell on cooling. And you start to see new Bragg reflections in the resonant scattering pattern um, at positions that correspond to this new expanded unit cell. And these X-ray measurements, and we'll see that the same is true of the neutron measurements a little bit later on, but in, in, in the fifth and sixth lecture, provide direct evidence uh, of, of magnetic ordering in, in materials. I'm gonna stop there. Um, we've got a couple more slides to do on resonant um, X-ray scattering measurements, again, in the domain of, of magnetism and superconductivity. Um, but I think that's probably enough for today. Um, and I'm happy to take, um, take any questions. So if I perhaps stop sharing for the moment and Christine will probably pop up again. Christine. Yes, you did. So thanks a lot uh, for this, uh, this talk. So I think it's uh, really interesting. Good. We have a question uh, from uh, Salema. Yeah. Um, use of vacuum make easy to handle process. So actually, um, Samela, the, it, it's a harder experiment. It's a much harder experiment in the vacuum. Um, the only reason you do it is because you want to eliminate the air scattering at the sulfur edge or the phosphorus edge or some other um, light edge. Um, other techniques will allow for experiments to use proteins to be less difficult. Um, I mean, yes, there are other techniques that give you structural insights into proteins. Um, I mean, the, the emerging technique that you may or may not be aware of, and which won the pioneers the Nobel Prize, ooh, I think it was in chemistry three years ago, was cryo-EM. So um, electron microscopy, which um, uh, enables crystal structure to be determined in biological molecules at unprecedented resolution, essentially because it allows you to take a movie of the structure and then um, from the movie, you can extract individual still images and compensate for the fact that during a, an electron microscopy experiment, the sample is heated and it moves in the beam. So it's a way of compensating uh, for a moving image in a conventional electron microscopy experiment. So these so-called cryo-EM measurements also provide incredibly powerful insights into proteins, but they also have to be done in a vacuum. Um, so, so I'm afraid you don't get <laughs> get around the vacuum that in that respect. And the protein, you know, the, the actual experiment um, itself, once you've built the diffractometer is, is, is pretty straightforward. But I would say between cryo-EM and, and, uh, and conventional MX measurements, these are the most powerful techniques to, to look at the 3D structure of a protein. Everything else tends to only give you part of the, you know, circular dichroism measurements can be used. Um, NMR measurements can be used, but they're, they're not as direct and powerful as, as uh, electron microscopy and, and, and MX measures, measurements. Indeed, so this brings a lot in terms of the, the sample environment. I mean, much more constrained to like two other yeah. things really running as expecting. Huh? And, and, and so the, I guess one of the things I've tried to put across um, is, 
nowadays the synchrotron is the easy bit. Um, I've already mentioned that growing the sample, uh, introducing it quickly, doing the data analysis, they become the more challenging bits. And what I think is really interesting now in, in synchrotron science um, is to try to put as many measurement systems in the beam as possible. You know, if you want to look at um, a material undergoing a transformation, then the challenge is to put, you know, the chemical reactor or the, um, the piece of equipment that you want to, for, for, an, for a manufacturing process, the challenge is to develop the equipment to perform these so-called operando, you know, in situ um, experiments. And again, the great thing about x-rays is because they're very strongly pen penetrating, um, you can get them in and out of these, these reactive chambers, these, these complicated piece of equipment. And you can start to look at real processes in real time in real operating conditions. But only because there is this automatization as well of all the equipment. And so it's not possible before, for instance. Yeah. Type yeah. Of, uh, yeah. yeah. And increasingly what you're getting is that people, you know, the majority of synchrotron users are not synchrotron experts at all. They simply want to use the synchrotrons to solve a problem. Um, and we have to accept that, you know, 30 years ago, all synchrotron users were professional synchrotron users, but they were small in number and they brought a limited range of science. Um, we've made the process much more democratic. Um, but that means there's a challenge. Excuse me, I've got to my throat. I can't find the mute button on Zoom. Oh, where's the mute? Oh, there we go, mute button. I'll mute next time. Right, I found the mute button. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it means that, uh, yeah, the evolution of those different technologies give possibility now to new tests, uh, and then as well to understand from the the, the development, this, um, I mean, it was so interesting what you described as well for the enzyme, how to, to find ways to match as well with those libraries, uh, with uh, those uh, little prize. Yeah, can libraries are small molecules. Exactly. So those, are, is it kind of a, a large fraction as well of the beam time that you have for those development? Because life science, this is something indeed maybe looking at what the, 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 the neutron source would do and what you are doing. So what is the distribution more or less for those type of, I mean, maybe now viruses is something. That I, I would can... say almost half my users are biologists. Half um, and biologists, okay. Yeah, and that's very different. So in neutron scattering, it's very different. Typically at a neutron source, you might have one, one to three beam lines that are, well, there'll be, there'll be one protein crystallography beam line at a neutron source. I've got seven. Um, so it's, it, and that's because it, it's, it's a much more, um, well, it, you know, it, it's a technique that the industry has used for decades and, um, it, it's just, it's just been used in, in structural biology for far longer. Um, it's very powerful in areas of neutron scattering. I mean, Matthew who joined Matthew Blakely is, is a pioneer in developing neutron methods for, um, uh, for, for diffraction and, and. There are certain things you can do with neutrons that you can't do with x-rays, but I would say probably 99 point something percent of all structural biology crystallography is done with x-rays. Because of the availability as well of the light source and because it's much easier as well to grow maybe the, the samples that would fit uh, with the synchrotron was with the, the neutron, it might be a bit more complicated and same thing, it has to be all under some environment that are maybe even more controlled because of the neutron? I think the, 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 the big difference is x-rays are much brighter. So you can get that crystallographic information far faster from a far smaller crystal. So the systems you look at with neutrons um, tend to require significantly larger crystals. And, and the difficulty in these biological systems is almost always first to grow, grow the crystal. So um, the, there are certain crystal systems you, you simply could not yet grow that big for neutrons. It's improved hugely. You know, you used to, you used to need to grow something as big as your, the end of your finger for a neutron experiment. That's no longer true. It can be a small fraction of a millimeter, but it's still big by, by X-ray standards. Um, and so, uh, Samela, yeah, reading material. Um, I, I think probably the easiest thing, Christine, is just, I mean, there are, there are references to textbooks, I think, in the first instance. There are one or two good textbooks in this area, uh, and that's probably the first 
thing. Okay. And I, I don't think I've got source material for reading, do I? No, because the, 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 the material that I was mentioning, I mean, I was the one which is maybe more general. So if you look at the link that I sent there again, so you will have uh, more of the courses, the Hercules courses, for instance, or more how to build um, an accelerator, yeah. but not on that very aspect. So, so this is maybe good for next time. Maybe we can as well make a, um, a, a kind of a call so that we can bring yeah. some more library or more. There is, a, there is a particularly good up-to-date general textbook for synchrotron science by phil wilmot who's at the swiss light source and i would say that's that's the broadest mo i mean it's only a year old it's very up to date and it covers the fundamentals all the way through to really modern applications um i, I would recommend that as the best book um, but we'll, we'll we'll write the reference down on the on the website oh christine's off to look at her books what have you got there what's that Maybe this one is really good as well. So, uh, yeah. Okay, an extreme ultra radiation. So I don't actually know that book. Yeah. Oh, hang on. If you move your thing, yeah. David Atwood. Yes, I should know it. Okay. It's at the soft end of what I do. So, um, yeah. Yeah. For the soft, maybe not soft side. Yeah, very good. So we don't have uh, more. We don't. That's all right. But I think what I'm, I mean, it was really interesting as well to see examples. So, so we have uh, Franz and Sarah is here as well with us. So Sarah is working in our team as well for the innovation and all this different aspect. And I think it's really good as well to see what we can do with, uh, for instance, uh, the, the possibility for the environment, for this plastic, those bacteria to, to grow and to find as well some, some um, resistant uh, bacteria or to have more possibility as well for solar cell I mean that's one of the things yeah. that I will develop and, and then I guess you will speak a bit more as well for the battery and for all those uh, um, I'll touch on batteries mostly under neutrons um, because they're particularly good at looking at protons and at lithium um, but you know I mean industry very strongly engages with synchrotrons there's almost 200 companies that pay to use diamond and the same is true at many other synchrotrons it's less true with neutron scattering partly because um yeah people are just not as aware so i think i think the key challenge in engaging with industry first of all is to convince them that there are benefits and most people who who do a science degree have done some form of x-ray diffraction or x-ray scattering at some point in their course um, learning about neutrons is much less common you know m most universities will not have a course that touches on neutrons i just happen to have professors who are neutron scatterers and this is exactly what we should potentially find as well ways. And we have some that are developing here, those types yep. of, of syllabus uh, with the Lund University. But definitely for us at the assessor, so that's something which is important. And indeed, yep. it's more like because the community is maybe 10 times larger as well as the extra. Like, it's, Isn't that's it? a good question. I, I wouldn't say 10 times, but maybe three or four, maybe five. I do, I've not really added it up. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it, it is a lot bigger, yes. Yeah. But it, it's all about yeah, the combination as well of uh, both of that. Yeah. So and then we will have, so so it's really good that you give all those information. So with the X-ray and the neutron, so this is what you will do as well in the course of five. Yeah, and absolutely. And after, so we'll have four courses as well. One will be about the magnetism as well. We'll have Pascal, Pascal Dean. Yeah, so and I'll touch on magnetism in, 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 in dealing with neutrons. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Really good. So this part that you finished with, yeah, I think was also very good as well. As yeah. Well. So I, I have two more. I've got two more slides which touch a bit more deeply on the magnetism, and then we'll we'll move to spectroscopy, and we'll have some art next time. Some Synchrot synchrotrons in the in the service of art restoration, something yeah, we do as well. With the yeah, with the heritage. So that's something also very important for the art. Indeed, we have yeah. one in the Louvre, huh? Huh? one accelerator as well. Down in Lovely the work on stuff in the Louvre in other galleries, and you know, and and there are countries. So you know, the 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 synchrotron in the Middle East, mm -hmm. Sesame in um, in Jordan. You know, a, a part of the you know critical part of the economy is is cultural heritage. Um, these these are things which are not just beautiful objects but they're in some parts of the world they're critical parts of the local economy as well so and if we've seen this in in some of the work also in well is it is it is it um is it cultural heritage is it is it science but you know the work on um uh early humans hominids um from 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 africa from south africa in particular again lovely synchrotron work looking at the evolution of of mankind from some of these earliest origins in in 
in in in in East Africa and South Africa. Yeah, but that's not actually something I'll touch on. That's work that's best described by the people at the ESRF. We, exactly. This is what I wanted to say. Maybe we can find as well those reference there. There was this wonderful presentation two weeks ago with you. Francesca Setti. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, the, the the student or the postdoc uh, who she presented uh, all those uh, or he presented. I think it was a he. Uh, all the different uh, development there that was just uh, amazing and this is something of course in africa that is one of the the driver not yeah. moving you know, all these artifacts as well also the, the fragility of that but, uh, yeah but that's the key that's the key consideration you know, when you build these synchrotrons first and foremost you have to look around you at what your science community and what your society needs and where it's society you know it will depend on what are the industries uh and what are the societal things which are important to your your and they'll be very different in different parts of the world you know in some parts of the earth it'll be agriculture and mining in others it'll be the electronics industry and high-tech material so it's um and the great thing about um synchrotrons in particular is they're so widely applicable you can generally find an application to key industries mm -hmm. um, you know coming back to the middle east it's critical to them to develop their mineral resources better to understand how to preserve and use their water better um, and as i've said cultural heritage so these these are really interesting challenges here why do you build a synchrotron in this place well you build it to do much better science but you also build it to support the local economy mm -hmm. definitely so that's uh, this is really all the science case uh, that will as well be the reason of, of developing specific uh, maybe nine uh, yeah. or maybe as well the easiest at the beginning with maybe power and uh, power diffraction was one of the the easy one to develop exactly. the tuning of, uh, of all the, the machine, but then after that, they can tune. So that's uh, how hopefully it will go. So, yeah. So, Christine, we, we'll meet again in two days. We'll like, is it Thursday? Exactly on the Thursday, so at the same time. So we will have, uh, yeah, we'll bring up more material maybe as well to have uh, a little, I think it's a nice idea. Yeah. To have uh, some material as reference. Uh, if there are more questions by then, feel free to send us email. I think on the Indico, we have our email address, so that would be as well more than welcome. And then we can tune, of course, to anything that uh, would be needed. And uh, so in the meantime, so stay safe. <laughs> okay, you too. You too. And, and everybody else, stay safe. Take care. Okay. It's getting dark. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye for now. Bye for now. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye, everybody. See you in a couple of days. Yeah.